Good morning. Okay, so we are here in San Diego and we are gonna go ahead and get started and with our opening story. Okay, here we go. In 1892, a Stanford student, an 18 year old student was struggling to pay his fees. He was an orphan and not knowing where to turn for money, he came up with a bright idea. He and a friend decided to host a musical concert on campus to raise money for their education. They reached out to the great pianist, Ignacy J. Padursky. Padursky. Yeah, sorry. His manager demanded a guaranteed fee of $2,000 for the piano recital. A deal was struck and the boys began to work to make the concert a success. The big day arrived, but unfortunately, they had managed to not managed to sell enough tickets. The total collection was only $1,600. Disappointed, they went to Padursky and explained their plight. They gave him the entire $1,600 plus a check for the balance of $400. They promised to honor the check as soon as possible. No, said Podorsky, this is not acceptable. He tore up the check, returned the $1,600 and told the boys, here's the $1,600. Please deduct whatever expenses you have incurred. Keep the money you need for your fees and just give me whatever is left. The boys were surprised and thanked him profusely. It was a small act of kindness, but it clearly marked out Podorsky as a great human being. Why should he help two, bo two people he did not even know? We all come across situations like these in people's lives. If I don't help them, what will happen to them? They don't do it expecting something in return. They do it because they feel it's the right thing to do. Good morning, Lupe. Perduski later went on to become the Prime Minister of Poland. He was a great leader, but unfortunately when, world war, when the World War began, Poland was ravaged. There were more than 1.5 million people starving in his country. Good morning, Sheree, good to see you. And no money to feed them. Perduski did not know where to turn for help. He reached out to the US Food and Relief Administration for help, and here he heard there was a man called Herbert Hoover, who later went on to become the US president. Hoover agreed to help and quickly shipped tons of food, grains to feed the starving Polish people. A calamity was averted and Perduski was relieved. Good morning, Miss Laurie, good to see you. He decided to go across to meet Hoover and personally thank him. When Perduski began to thank Hoover for his noble gesture, Hoover quickly interjected and said, you shouldn't be thanking me, Mr. Prime Minister. You may not remember this time several years ago you helped two young students go through college. I was one of them. The world is a wonderful place. What goes around comes around. Please help others to be the, to the best of your ability. In the long run, you may be helping yourself and God never forgets anyone who sows a good seed in other people, never. Nothing in nature lives for itself. Rivers don't drink their own water. Trees don't eat their own fruit. Sun doesn't give heat for itself. Flowers don't spread fragrance for themselves. Living for others is the rule of nature and therein lies the secret of living. I love that story for today because it showed that when we do good, when we try and, and, and support God's vision of giving to the world, God will always give you back far more than you could possibly imagine. Okay, so we're going to open in prayer and get started with our devotions. Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you that you brought me here to San Diego for School of Ministry. I pray that you would bless those that hear the message this morning, and I pray that it would be enriching to their lives, and I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are going through overcoming the world and worldliness. So... Our first verse is 2 Chronicles 30, 6 through 9. 2 Chronicles 30, 6 through 9. 2 Chronicles 30, 6 through 9. So we see, now it's Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is um, the king of Israel. Sent word to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh. So he is the king and he's celebrating the Passover. Okay, now they have already been taken into slavery. I believe they have been um, restored to their land. And now he's going to start celebrating the way they're supposed to back. Oh, good morning, Miss Candace. I'm glad that you're here. Back the way they were supposed to. So, at the king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with the letters from the king and from the officials which read, People of Israel, 
return to the Lord. Good morning, Miss Candace. Return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Okay, so remember I was just telling you that, yes, so this is after they had been taken captive and now they are um, they're returning. And so God is wanting them to worship him. And he's using Hezekiah as a leader to lead those people back into a relationship with God, right? Because God does that, right? Because God puts leaders in power, right? And we may not understand why God puts those leaders in power, but we trust that God is in control and God is big and we are not. And that's my little put in there for the government. Okay, there we go. So, do not be like your fathers and brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their fathers, so that he made them an object of horror as you see. Good morning, Katie, good to see you. Okay, did you catch that? Hezekiah tells the people, you need to return to the Lord. You need to understand that God has brought you and allowed you to escape from where you were at, right? He's giving you back your land, right? And he's telling them, do not be like your fathers and brothers who are unfaithful to the Lord. Oh, wow. God is giving us a chance to forsake where we were unfaithful at to come back to where we can be faithful in. God is a God like that, right? God can do stuff like that and we can trust that God is in control when he brings us out of unfaithful situations and brings us into faithful ones. Trust that God has got a plan and a purpose that you may not understand, but he does and he knew and it doesn't take him by surprise when we're in that unfaithful situation. He's not, oh, what are you doing there? No, 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 he totally knew you were gonna be there. But guess what? He's already prepared a place for you to come out of that unfaithful situation and to be faithful and restore that relationship with him, right? Okay, so we see, do not be as stiff necked as your fathers. Submit to the Lord, come to the sanctuary which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. Okay, now see, sometimes people don't like the God of fierce anger. Nobody likes the God of fierce anger. Okay, let's just be honest. Nobody wants to deal with the God of fierce anger. We all want to deal with the God of love, right? The God of peace, the God of patience with us. Maybe not patience with those people we don't like, but patience with us, right? We don't want to deal with the God of anger. Nobody wants that, okay? But nevertheless, God is a God of anger. Why would God be angry? Oh, I don't know. Could it be because we are stiff-necked? What's stiff-necked mean, right? I don't know what God's thinking, putting me in this situation. Now here I, that when you do this thing and you don't understand, that's your stiff-necked thing going on, okay? When you feel yourself getting all self-righteous, there you are, you are stiff-necked, okay? God had a word for it way back then. It's called stiff necked. You gotta get rid of your stiff neck, okay? Lest he break it down. Don't wanna break down your stiff neck. Let's just give it up, okay? So he's telling them, do not be a stiff neck people. Submit to the Lord. How do we get rid of our stick, stiff neck? We submit. We say, you know what, Lord? It's not all about me. It's all about you. It's bowing down your will to God's will. Don't be stiff necked. Be willing. Submit. Understand you are not God. You don't want to be in that situation, right? Come to the sanctuary. What does that mean? We got to come to the sanctuary. Good morning, Mr. Renee. I'm glad that you're watching. We got to come to the sanctuary. Come to where God is at. Come to where God is leading you. God is asking you to come to the sanctuary and come to where he is at so you can build up that relationship with him. He doesn't want you to remain unfaithful. He doesn't want you to remain outside. He wants you to break down your will, submit to who he is so you are no longer that stiff necked people running your head. You are submitting to who God is in your life. And that's where God wants you because that's where we can build a relationship because that's where we can restore who we are, who we were back to who we are, right? Who we are in Christ. So come to the sanctuary, he says. And then what? We're here in 2 Chronicles 30, 10 through 13. Come to the sanctuary. He has consecrated it forever. The sanctuary is consecrated. God has a place that is perfect for you to be able to worship him in. And he wants you to 
go back into fellowship. He wants you to be with those that are in the sanctuary. Be with the people that are growing in God and helping you help others grow in God, right? God wants to build you up. Get to where it's consecrated forever. Serve the Lord, right? Because we go to the sanctuary so we can serve God, so we can help others serve God, because it's that growing relationship with Him, right? And His fierce anger will turn away from you. You want to get out of God's anger? Then submit to God. His fierce anger is only against those that are against Him. When we are not against God, we are not in the path of His fierce anger. You are the one that causes yourself to be in the path of his fierce anger. It's only because we are out of his will. And we go on. If you return to the Lord, then your brothers and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn his face from you if you return to him. God wants you to return to him. God will see fit to make sure that wherever you're at, if you are in a situation where there are those that are oppressing you, if you are right with God, God will make sure that those people that are showing you oppression will have compassion. He can turn oppression from those that are against you into compassion. Compassion. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. We can't do it. We aren't capable. God is capable of turning the oppression of others into compassion. Only God can do that. And God says, God says he will. So he will. Do you believe it? Do you believe it or do you think that God is not real? Do you doubt his love? Do you doubt his honor? Because if he says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. He's a man of his word. And so we see here, how do we overcome the world and worldliness? We submit to God's will. We, are, we go back to the sanctuary. We, we have that relationship back with him. We come back to his land. We submit and we know and we return to him. You know if you've returned to him. You can be in re you can be out of relationship with the Lord yet still be around the right people and saying the right lingo, but only you know if you are right with God. Come back to God. God is speaking to somebody right now because somebody is not right with God. Yet everybody around you might think you're right with God and you're feeling that fierce anger, and you're feeling that oppression, and you don't understand why it will get right with God. Get right with God. God wants you to have that right relationship with Him. God wants you to be in fellowship with Him. Overcome the world by submitting to God, right? Okay, so we also wanna learn how to praise. Praise, how do we praise? We overcome the world by praising God. Good morning, Terry, I'm glad that you're here. I'm a little late today too, I'm down in San Diego, so. Okay, we overcome the world and worldliness by praising God. And that's in Psalms 9, 1 through 2. Psalms 9, 1 through 2. Yes, I'm down here for school of ministry. So, okay. Psalms 9, 1 through 2. This is, this is David's psalm. And it's called the death of the son. He's lost his son. He's lost his son. And he's singing praise. Can you even fathom that? Can you fathom the loss of a son, yet singing praise to God? God's not asking you to deny your feelings, but God's asking you to have a right heart and a right mindset with Him. In Psalms 9, 1 through 2, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name. Oh, most high. Only God can do that. Only God can meet you where you're at in the loss of a child and help you to give praise to God because that's what's going to get you through, because that's what's going to give you hope, because that's what's going to give you a future. I had a miscarriage in high school, and that child would be 26 years old today. and. When you have a loss of a child, it never goes away. But that child is always waiting for you. And it's, this is what can give you the hope. This is what can give you the future. Because but God, right? But God. God says, praise me. When you're hurt, when you're angry, when you don't understand, when there is no words, when you just don't even have words, God says, 
says, praise me, praise me. And when we can praise him for his wonders and when we can praise him with all our heart and when we can praise him, just saying his name, praise to your name, O Most High. Sometimes we don't have words and all we can say is Jesus. I understand, Joanne, yeah. We can't fathom the loss of a child. Some people have never even suffered something like that. But God, because we will all at one point suffer some kind of a loss, but God. And when you are in that place, maybe all you can say is the name of Jesus. And he's giving you what you need for right now. For you to be able to give that hope to somebody and to be able to have that hope at some point in time. So that's for somebody as well. Make sure that you have the ability to praise in any and every situation. And if you don't even have words, to just be able to say the name of Jesus, right? And lastly, we want to walk in obedience. Walking in obedience in Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. And we see the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. We're talking about those Israelites again, right? God is wanting them to have the fear of the Lord. And yes, loss is so painful, Miss Candace, but we have hope, right? We can praise the Lord and we can have hope and we can choose to not dwell in those situations, not live there forever. God isn't telling you to ignore those feelings. God's not telling you to act like they don't exist, but God is giving you the ability in the steps that is needed to be able to come back into a relationship with him. Because when we are in those pits of despair, the devil wants to keep us there, right? The, the devil wants to keep us where we are inactive and we are hopeless and we are fearful. But God, right? But God. So we can give that praise to God and that helps us to get through to the other side. So we also see that we can walk in obedience. And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God. Are we supposed to be afraid of God? That's not what he's saying. Fear God means to respect God. We should respect our parents. We should respect authority. We should fear God the same way. We should fear God that we want to do what's right by him, that we want to follow what he's asking us to do, that we can be right relationship with him. That's what he's asking. Fear God. Fear God, right? Praise God, Lupe. Thank you so much. Okay, so we see here, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, love him, to serve him, serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. That's it. That's how we walk in obedience. Walking in obedience is fearing God, doing what he asked you to do, loving him, serving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. God gives you every direction you need to be able to have a right relationship with him, to be able to share what a right relationship with him is. All you have to do is apply it. It's taking it up and doing it. It's not enough for you to listen to what I'm saying. It's you taking it up and living it today. So this is where God is saying, fear the Lord. It's you and your relationship with God. It's not me. It's you and your relationship with God. And God is saying, walk in obedience. Now, if we don't have a relationship with God, there's nothing to obey, right? If we're walking in the world and we're doing whatever the world is telling us we, we can do, we're doing everything for ourselves, there's no walking in obedience. There's no relationship. There's no reason to fear God, right? Because this is all there is. Without a relationship with God, this life is all you have. Well. I come to tell you that this is not enough, right? If this is all there is, this is not enough. Because everything you see around you, as beautiful as this place is right now that I'm in, is not enough. God has a place and a plan and a purpose for you that exceeds what you can even think or comprehend. And he wants to give you that. He wants to give you a hope and a future. And he wants to give you life to the fullest, to the fullest now. God doesn't want you to hold on to what's good. God wants you to open your hand to what is far better than you could possibly imagine now, to live life to the fullest now. How do we do that? That's where our Romans road comes in, where Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. We are all falling short. But what? 
Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God wants you to have eternal life. God wants you to live life to the fullest. God wants you to have a hope and a future. So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we go from not having a relationship with God, not living in fear of God, walking in obedience or praising Him for anything? How do we go from being lost in our sin to being found in our Savior? Romans 5.8 says God's love for us was that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you when you were at your worst because he loved you that much and he wanted to have a relationship with you. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. God wants you to have that relationship. God wants to give you hope. God wants to give you a future, but you have to choose it. It's nothing someone can make you do. It's not something that can be forced on you. It is something that God offers to you and you have to accept it as your own and you have to confess it with your own mouth and you have to believe it with your own heart. So what does that look like? That's you praying to God. That's you praying to God and saying, Lord, I come before you and I am a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I fall short. Lord, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you are my savior. I believe that you love me. And Lord, I confess I need you. I confess that you are the savior that I need in my life. I confess I want to live my life for you. Fill me, Lord. Show me, lead me, guide me. I want to be in a relationship with you. I accept you as my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. It's you having a relationship with God. So then what happens? Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord is saved. There are whosoever's that I will meet today, whosoever's that are in your life that need the Lord, that need the Lord. So how do we get them the Lord? We need to be, be sharing, be sharing this message, be sharing your, your message that God is giving you, be sharing what God is doing in your life. Be, be in the word. Be in the word so you can hear what God is saying to you. Be, be in prayer. Be in prayer so you can be talking to God. And be in a Bible-believing church. You need to be surrounded by other Christians where you can grow and you can help others grow. So you can have that relationship working together in the sanctuary, serving God and doing what he's called you to do. So then what happens? When we have that relationship with God, God wants you to grow in that relationship with him. God wants you to be be in, in a relationship with him that has what? That is abundant. He wants to bless you, right? He wants to enlarge your territory of influence. He wants you to be surrounded by him and he wants you to be free from pain. And that's where we have the prayer of Jabez journal that comes in that I've been going through with you guys. And right now we are still on, oh Lord, bless me indeed. We are on the secret of abundance. And the secret of abundance is Psalms 37, three through four, the secret of abundance, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Again, that was Psalms 37, three through four. Many Christians have a theology brimming with trust, but a heart full of suspicion. We might trust God, but then we're suspicious as to why he's allowing this to happen. Why is why do I feel like this? Why, if they're a Christian, why do they act like this? We are suspicious of why things are the way they are. One morning I was showing a group of men how to use a prayer journal. I had my own journal open on the table in front of me, and I turned the pages to show the men the prayers I had marked off as answered. There were hundreds of them. A big guy across the table leaned over, grabbed the journal, peered at it in disbelief. You don't tell me that you're supposed to pray for things you want. He almost yelled, okay? That is what I'm telling you, I said. Why would God want you to pray for things you don't want? Think of something you really want. God will answer. He'll either say yes or he'll say no. It's wrong and harmful for you. He'll say no. Or if he wants you to give you an opportunity to learn something important, he might give it to you anyway. But he'll be delighted that you trusted him enough to ask. We don't have our requests answered because we don't ask. And I have been, had the blessing of three of, of prayer requests that my kids have came to me with 
be answered in like less than a month. And my kids actually yeah, texted me back, I don't know if you're praying or something, but like things are being answered. And I'm like, cause God is amazing. Cause God is in control. Cause God wants to bless because he, because we ask and because it's right. If we're giving God glory and honor with what we're asking, why wouldn't he want to answer that request? And I encourage you to bring all your requests, spiritual, emotional, and material to God in prayer. Count on the proven fact that your father's nature is to be faithful and generous. Good morning, Lori. I'm glad that you're here. Always seeking your best. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. With this kind of father, you can't be too candid or specific. He won't chide you or turn you away. God wants to hear your prayers. God wants, to, wants you to ask for what you need. And when we're asking with the right heart, when we're asking for something that is going to give him honor and glory, that is going to grow in our relationship with him, he wants to answer those requests. But he wants to answer when we ask, right? Great, great asking always starts here with genuine trust. After all, you would ask your best friend, not the neighborhood bully, for help. You're convinced of your friend's motives and affection for you. You've established a reason to believe that only good will come of your request, right? And if your good friend is, would help you answer that request, wouldn't all the more God be there to answer that request with you as well? Once trust takes root in your heart, you are ready to take the next bold step into blessed life. I think of it as Jabez's secret, pl plenty, secret of plenty. Plead with him to grant you what he wants to give you. God wants to give you good and great things. God wants to bless you. But we get to where we feel, I think it's almost like we feel we're not worthy to ask God for anything. And we're not, who am I to ask God? God loves you. God wants you to ask. When your kids ask for something and they're asking for something with the right heart and they want to be a blessing to somebody or they want to be blessed and be able to give, don't you want to answer those requests? When they have a wrong heart and when they're not asking out of good intentions, then we use those as teachable moments, right? Well, God's the same way. God's the same way. You are like a daughter who kneels before her father, hands open, waiting. When her father asks her what she wants, she replies, her reply is simple. I've been thinking, she says a little hesitantly. I want lots of things, but but I want I want most of all is what you really, really want to give me. God wants to give you what he really, really wants to give you, but we really need to ask. It's if the thought, if just the thought of such a bold and open-ended request makes you quake, I understand. Amazing things will happen when you pray like that. But if you fear that God will lose on your head just the kind of miserable life you dread, look again at your friend. Take measure of his character and his love for you. Remember his record of loyalty to you. Let go of all your unfound suspicions. God is not waiting for you to ask for something from him so he can unleash the gates of hell on you. That, that's not who God is. And if that's who you think God is, then you need to reevaluate your relationship with God because God is a God that wants to give you good things. God wants to bless you. And God wants to answer your specific request. Don't just ask God for a good day. Lord, I pray for a good day. Lord, I pray that you make me happy. Oh, okay, no, pray for something specific. Pray for that specific job that needs to happen. Pray for that specific relationship that needs to be fixed. And when that happens, give glory and honor to God because God's the one that did it. That's what God wants to answer, those specific requests in your life, okay? Remember, remember, and tremble instead of, instead because the supernatural life of fulfillment and influence you've been looking for is about to unfold. This is what God has for you. God wants to bless you. The secret of to abundance is to want what God wants. I encourage you to repeat the secret to yourself throughout your day. Let its truth rearrange your priorities and change the way you think. The secret of true abundance, right? From my own experience and that of so many others, I know what will happen as you move forward in this part of your Jabez adventure. God will prove himself to you so much that your trust in him will grow by leaps and bounds. 
Do you want your trust in God to grow? Then you need to ask for things and give God glory when they, you receive them. Your desires will be increasingly in line with his will and you will identify more and more with his values and his wonderful purposes for you and his world. And one day you will look at your life in happy disbelief. You'll realize that along the way you developed a habit of abundance. Why? Because his power to bless you and to bless others through you was unleashed and unhindered in your life. The secret of true abundance in my life is to want what God wants. Do you want what God wants in your life? Do you even know what God wants in your life? That's the true question. Do you even have an idea of what God wants in your life or is it all about what you want? What are two or three wonderful things God wants for me? God wants to bless me. God wants my husband and I to be in ministry. God wants us to be able to do that without the worry of money to be able for me to be able to speak, for my husband to be able to do media for me as we as I go along the road, as I promote books that are my own, not just reading from other people's books. God wants to bless me like that because why? Because I want to be a blessing to other people. I have a healed life that I want to share with other people. And that's the blessings I know for me that God is wanting to do for me. And God will do it because he's put that vision in my heart. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God will do what he says he's going to do, what he's purposed in my heart that he will do. What does God want to do for you? Do you have an idea? You need to reevaluate what God wants to do in your life. The purpose of all prayer is to find out, to find God's will and to make that will our prayer. The purpose of all prayer is to find God's will and to make that will our prayer. And that's Catherine Marshall. Find God's will, make that will your prayer. I pray you have a blessed day and I'll see you at lunchtime because I'm down here and so I'll be doing another one at lunch. Thanks so much for your time. God bless.